Good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me introduce the panelists first. I'll uh, try to be brief. Uh, Maya McGinnis, to my immediate left, is president of the Bipartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, uh, where she oversees committee projects, including but not limited to uh, the Grassroots Coalition Fix the Debt, uh, Fix US, a project, is it Fix US or Fix Us? That's kind of the cleverness. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, a, a project seeking to better understand the root causes of our nation's uh, growing divisions and deteriorating political system. Maya is also a returning Principles First panelist, having joined me here two years ago uh, as we sought to give some definition to the term fiscal conservatism. Uh, Doug Holtz Eakin is president of the American Action Forum, a center right nonpartisan domestic policy think tank. Uh, before founding AAF in 2009, Doug taught economics at Syracuse University, served as chief economist on President Bush's uh, Council of Economic Advisors, served as director of the Congressional Budget Office from 2003 to 2005, and then as director of domestic and economic policy for the John McCain presidential campaign. And on the end, we have Brian Riedel, uh, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Brian's research is mostly in the areas of federal spending, tax policy, uh, and the debt. Uh, as well as broad macroeconomic issues like inflation and economic growth. Uh, Brian has also served as chief economist to Senator, Senator Rob Portman, uh, staff director of the Senate Finance Subcommittee on Fiscal Responsibility and Economic Growth, uh, and in policy positions with the Mitt Romney and Marco Rubio presidential campaigns. Uh, so welcome to, uh, to all the panelists. Uh, and thanks uh, to all of you in the audience for spending your Saturday afternoon with us for the Dismal Science panel. <laughs> uh, so most of you all probably recall from the Clinton years the, the line, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, polls tell us that the economy is the number one topic voters want government to work on. Um, but voters have different ideas about what economic issues are important now. Uh, and depending on their political leanings, widely divergent views on the state and the direction of the economy. According to a Suffolk University poll last month, 46% of Americans think we're either in a recession or a depression right now. Uh, another 21% think we're in a period of stagnation. And only 29% think we're in a period of recovery or economic growth. The reality, the US economy grew at an inflation adjusted rate of two and a half percent last year and averaged 3.4 percent real growth over the last three years. Unemployment last year tied for the lowest level of my lifetime, reaching 3.4 percent for the first time since 1969, uh, and still only slight, we're still only slightly off that level. And wage and salary incomes of Americans have grown by 5.2% over and above the rate of inflation since the last quarter before the pandemic. So does the economy stink or is it strong? And that's where we'll start. Uh, this will be sort of a lightning round, a few minutes each on two questions. How is the economy today really? And what are the top economic policy issues that we should be concerned about? So we'll, we'll start right here. With me. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, first, I just want to say thank you. It's great to be here. This is truly an organization that I'm such a fan of um, and really glad to be a part of it. And if there's like the volunteer coordinator out there, I will volunteer. Sign me up. I'd love to help. But I just think it's such an important organization. And how great is it that people have all come together for this conference? So happy to be a part of it. How is the economy doing? Um, I think the economy is doing really pretty well in the immediate, which isn't what interests me the most. I think. Uh, the economy's strong. I worry about inflation probably a little bit more than a lot of people are worrying about inflation. I'm not sure that we've got it under control. Um, but I think given the challenges that it took to get us here, it is a generally strong economy um, in the moment. I think I'll just give three things that I worry about the most, though, and that's why I spend all my time worrying about everything. So the three biggest in the economy, and I could also do top ten, but the three biggest... Um, <laughs> Not surprisingly for me, because I've devoted my career to it, is the fiscal health of the country. We are, and I could just go on, we could all go on with long lists of the numbers, but we are so in debt, we are close to the record that we've ever been in debt in this country. The last time it came after World War II, this time came after no war. Our interest payments are soaring, we're spending more than defense, like long, long, long list. And it means that we are weak, not just from an economic perspective and vulnerable, but also from a national security perspective. But the two others I would add to my list, 
I'm very worried about income inequality on its own, but also more so because it is causing people to lose trust in the economic system. Many people think that the system is not fair, it's rigged against them, that if they play by the rules, they still won't get ahead. And that leads to my third worry, which is that I am particularly worried that people are starting to walk away from the system of capitalism and markets being used for the allocation of capital because they are uh, having, losing trust in our economic system and that we are thereby going to end up with things which are really bad for the economy, are going to slow growth dramatically. We're going to stop considering growth um, as much as we should in our policy decisions. Smaller economic pie is going to lead to even more political tension than we already have. So I'm both worried about the problems with capitalism, but I'm worried that people are about to reject it rather than making some tweaks to improve it, um, and that would be very dangerous. Well, the voters are always right. Um, and uh, well, first of all, thank you for the chance to be here. This is my first time. Um, it's a fantastic organization. I question only how you spend your, your Saturday afternoons. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think the voters are onto something, and I think they're onto um, some concerns about the near term, where I would say there remains an elevated chance of a recession in the, the second quarter of this year. Inflation is not yet back, that genie is not yet back in the bottle. So those concerns are real and legitimate. But the larger concern is the fact that in the 21st century, we grew quite rapidly. GDP per capita, crude measure of income per person or the standard of living, uh, grew at 2.4% per year. No one needs to remember that number. All you needed to know is that in one working career, 29 years, the standard of living would double. In the 21st century, we're growing at 1.4, and the standard of living doubles every 56 years. And so it's true. People feel like they can't get ahead. The access to the American dream is disappearing over the horizon. Had we kept growing at the 21st, 20th century rate in the 21st century, everybody in this room would have another $19,000 in real GDP. I want my 19. I think you should want your 19, too. And uh, so that's, that is our biggest problem. We have an enormous growth problem. Part of that growth problem feeds the deficit. If, if GDP was as high as it, as it should be, we'd have another $1.2 trillion a year in revenue. Given the deficits we face, $12 trillion would be handy over the next 10 years. And the deficit and the structure of the federal budget is the biggest headwind to economic growth. And so if we take on the deficit, we can take on the growth problem. That's the number one thing we should do. Thank you. And again, thank you for coming out on a Saturday. Um, you know, the best news about the economy is the unemployment rate is low. The bad news about it is really the unemployment rate is low just as a result of a typical inflationary overheating that we've had over the past couple of years. The inflation rate has come down, but prices haven't. Prices are still up 18% since President Biden took office. You see it when you get gas, you see it when you go to the grocery store. Wages have generally not kept up. They have started growing a little bit more, but depending on how you calculate wages, uh, compensation, whether you remove co composition effects, a lot of real wages are still down. And ultimately, real wages is what matters the most. Economic growth, real wages, are you getting ahead? But it's not even just the, you know, the numbers on growth. The cost of buying a home has doubled since in the last three years, if you take into account the rise in interest rates at the same time of a rise in prices, the mortgage on a median priced home is double what it was three years ago. Moving forward, I think my, my first concern about the economy is that really we've been powered by a series of bubbles. In the late 90s, we were powered by a stock market bubble. That had a painful burst. Then we had a housing bubble power us for the next eight years. That burst painfully. And now I'm worried we have a debt bubble that's been powering us ever since. And I'm worried that that's going to be the worst burst of all. And I really hope we can talk more about the, the deficit numbers because we just had the deficit double to its highest level in American history outside of inf uh, war and recession. It went from $1 trillion to $2 trillion in one year. And depending on what you think about the tax cuts and interest rates, we could be heading for deficits of 3 to $4 trillion by the end of the decade if we don't. And my concern is, just like the other two bubbles didn't end well, if we don't get a hold on our budget, this bubble will not end well either. Okay. Uh, 
thank you for all of that. Uh, there were some issues I hadn't actually uh, uh, thought you would mention, but uh, um, we're going to start, uh, and that's an excellent segue to where I wanted to start, uh, with a deeper dive on deficits and debt. Um, Maya, I've, I've recently watched your policy director, Mark Goldwein, and if y'all aren't familiar with uh, the committee's website, there is so much content there that is very informative there and there are video presentations like this one that I'm talking about. Um, it was called uh, Riches to Rags. So I was thinking we could start with the question that, that he tries to answer with regard to our massive national debt, which is basically how did we get here? Uh, what policy choices, Maya, over the last couple of decades have been the biggest drivers of deficits and debt? Yeah, so um, this is a study that we undertook because any time we go and like testify for Congress or talk about the issue of deficits and debt, it just starts into this painful finger pointing game between the two political parties. It is your fault. No, it is your fault. Um, and it is, it's like just right there. I, I, I'm always afraid that um, while I'm doing a congressional hearing, I'm just going to suddenly lose my temper and start <laughs> yelling like, you guys are breaking the countries. No, the country, none of you care about this. None of you are like, you're acting like children. I'm embarrassed for my children to watch you. And so I should stop testifying until I <laughs> learn to meditate or something. <laughs> but there's been just an incredible blame game going around. And the biggest part of it started when they're on the Democratic side. It could have been on the other side. There was a chart that showed if we had not cut taxes under the Bush era and the Trump era, our budget situation would be fine. We would not have deficits. And we went and I said, you know, I, I bet that's probably true, but I bet that's not the whole part of the story. We went and looked at this. And basically, it shows that whether you look at spending or revenues, they've all on their own contributed so much that we've kind of deteriorated the situation from when we were running budget surpluses to deficits many times over. So what, what's really interesting we found is there's two ways to look at this. The legislation that you put in place, and what we found there is that the deterioration was about one-third from tax cuts, one-third from spending increases, and one-third from recovery from the crises, the Great Recession and COVID. Um, of uh, that legislation, by the way, close to 80% of it, bipartisan. This is not a Republican or a Democrat situation. Both parties love to borrow. And then the other way to think about it, look, the issue, look at the issue, is where are we with spending and revenues at GDP compared to where it was when we were running budget surpluses? And basically, if you look at it that way, one-third of the problem is revenues, and two-thirds of the problems are spending. The reason it's different there is because so much of our spending is automatic growth in the budget. You don't vote for it, or you know, legislation doesn't change it, but Social Security and Medicare keep going up automatically. And so we just wanted to put out the numbers, like get over the blame game. In fact, almost all of you voted for these things. There was enough on spending. If we hadn't done any spending increases, basically the debt could be close to paid off. If we hadn't done any tax cuts, our deficit would be maybe much, much lower than what it is. All of it has contributed. Everybody's been a part of it. One tiny other study that we recently did, because I was getting frustrated with the no, no new taxes pledge, like you promised not to raise taxes. I was just curious how many of the members who have promised not to raise taxes have raised spending, because in my mind, a courageous pledge would be no new spending or no new borrowing. But it turns out that roughly 80 to 90 percent of the folks who have taken the pledge not to raise taxes have also increased spending. So it's just there's such a hypocrisy, or a hypocrisy, and this is on both sides. You could look at all the people promising not to touch Social Security. But um, there are very few clean hands when it comes to how we got here. And if we don't stop and just start looking forward to the really tough choices that we are going to have to raise taxes, we are going to have to fix Social Security, uh, we are going to have to cut all sorts of spending, then we are going to be lost in this continued growing fiscal deterioration. OK, thank you. Um, so just to give you all some, some, some quick numbers, last year the federal budget deficit was $1.7 trillion. And federal debt held by the public today is 98% of GDP. Now, uh, just a few years ago, there were uh, so-called economists uh, promoting theories for why deficits and debt don't matter. We can just keep printing money and spending it as fast as we want. As long as we're issuing debt in US dollars, it's never going to matter. Um, so why is it important? We'll start with Doug and then, and then Brian. Um, 
uh, why is it important that we address the uh, deficits and the debt? Uh, it's very important. I just want to touch a little bit on, on, okay. on what yep. Maya went through. Um, you know, I, I was at the White House in 2001, 2002. I ran the CBO for, for three years after that. I was on the McCain campaign. I've been running a think tank that ostensibly testifies more than anyone else in the private sector over that period. So I, people ask me, like, what, what happened, Doug? I'm like, you were there. You did this. And <laughs> pretty much my fault. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, so, but, but I have thought a lot about it. And there's this old saying that budget is policy. And if you looked at the budgets of my old boss, George W. Bush, those budgets said we we're going to win the war on terror at all costs. That was it. If you looked at the Obama budgets and listened to them talk about them, they said, as long as the rich pay their fair share, it's all good. We can do the ACA. We can do whatever we want. We don't have to worry about it. Um, President Trump did not say one thing about debt or deficits four years in office. Not a word. No state of the union, nothing. The, this um, crowd came in and promised us build back better, whatever you want, just more and more and more. The most important economic fiscal educators in the country have for the 21st century told the American people there is no problem. So they don't think there's a problem. And so if you vote to raise taxes, cut spending, and fix the problem, you're going to lose your job. And that's where we are. It's, it's, just not, it's not complicated. The American people have to be told there's a problem. <clears throat> And I'm about to tell you why it's a problem. You're all going to fall asleep and then drink. But, um, you know, we do have a problem, and they, they need to be told. And, and then they will be willing to vote for people who will fix the problem and, and vote against people who won't. And the problem is really twofold. Um, number one, you know, we have these enormous deficits, $2 trillion a year over the next 10 years, probably bigger than the projections. Um, that's... that's cash that has to be raised by the federal government, and when they go into financial markets to get that cash, they are taking it at the expense of private firms and households and Americans who want to invest it in education and technologies and businesses and all the things that advance their real wages and their standard of living. So they're competing for that, and they're crowding it out, and it comes with the cost. <coughs> That's the, I think, most well-recognized channel by which this affects things. There's a really important channel that I don't think people understand. Our government is simply spending too much. And when it spends money, it doesn't invest. It subsidizes consumption. An economy can only grow if people save and invest in the future. What we do with our federal budget is we take that private sector investment dollar and we use it to subsidize consumption and thus steadily erect a headwind against uh, future economic growth. That is why we're growing slower in this century than we did last century. We are not taking care of business and we're eating away at the quality of the economy that we're leaving behind to the next generations. We're leaving them with a poorer standard of living and the financial bill. And so that is a big problem, and that has to be recognized and corrected. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna take a lot of the same points as Doug and just put my own emphasis on it. I'm a numbers person, so bear with me. Interest costs two years ago in the federal budget were 350 billion. Last year, they were $663 billion. Uh, next year, interest costs is going to pass defense, Medicare. A decade from now, depending on if we extend the tax cuts to everything else, interest costs alone could approach $2 trillion a year. At that point, 30% of your federal taxes will be paying interest on the debt. So you will work and pay taxes for three months out of the year just to pay interest. You're not, it's not going to finance a social security check, a veteran, or build a highway, just interest. And then it keeps going. Uh, over 30 years, we're on pace to borrow anywhere between 119 and $150 trillion, depending on current policy assumptions. By the end of that, you could be paying half or more of your money to the government just for interest. It's a, such a waste of money. And fun fact, every point interest rates rise adds $30 trillion in interest costs over 30 years. That's per point. That's another defense department. Now, all of this assumes interest rates stay low. But here's the problem. Let's say we're going to borrow $119 trillion over 30 years. Who's going to lend us $119 trillion? China only holds $1 trillion, and they're selling our bonds. Japan only holds $1 trillion. They're selling our bonds. The Fed holds $5 trillion. They don't want to finance the debt because that's inflation. 
how are we going to borrow $100 trillion from, what, domestic lenders, mutual funds, insurance companies, savings bonds for your kids, state and local governments? That's going to raise interest rates. You're not going to be able to borrow $100 trillion from Wall Street without raising interest rates. And that's when the debt hits you from that angle. Higher interest rates, higher debt costs, higher mortgage rates, higher business, um, uh, business tax rate or business investment uh, uh, interest rates, and you get less investment and growth. So debt bad. Would you mind if I can add we, a couple more? Because I'm just worried you guys are worried Can we do competing enough. fun facts? What? Yeah. Can we do competing fun facts? You go first. You go. I was going to do worries. You okay. do fun facts, and I'll do okay. more things to worry about. These are numbers that if you can remember and repeat, you will have no friends at cocktail parties. Ready? <laughs> I have no friends at cocktail Over parties. Th- yeah, done. <laughs> this, this, this is the biggest group I've been in in like six <laughs> years. <laughs> um, Are you guys all staying for cocktails <laughs> day? Over the next 10 years, uh, the federal government's going to spend $82 trillion. $12 trillion of it will be interest costs. So that, that's gone. 20 of it will be things that Congress actually votes on every year. The remaining 50 are on autopilot. These are the so-called entitlements, mandatory spending. Of that 50, 32 are Social Security and Medicare. What have your nation's leaders pledged not to touch? Social Security and Medicare. I win. (laughs) All right, I'm going to tick really quickly through a couple other concerns you need to have. So Doug is right that the crowding out is going to lead to slower economic growth. Brian is right that the the borrowing is leading to growing interest payments and the risk of higher interest rates, which will lead to a spiral. Beyond that, though, we do need to be able to borrow when emergencies happen, like COVID or downturns. We've always been able to borrow, and our rates have not gone up. That is an incredible privilege, which we are squandering. There's going to be more crises. They seem to be coming more and more regularly. It is going to become increasingly difficult for us to borrow when we should, because we borrow when we shouldn't. Another reason to worry is that we have a social contract that is absurdly outdated. It fixed the problems of last century. It was like not well suited for this century at all. We also have two trust funds, Social Security and Medicare, that are headed towards insolvency and political promises to do nothing. But we should be thinking about what we need to do for a new social contract that ensures against today's risks instead of the old risks. We don't have the money to even entertain that discussion. In terms of foreign policy, though, because this is the one that actually freaks me out a lot these days, Wars are not about boots on the ground in the same way that they used to, right? They are economic and they are digital. Our ability to be economically and fiscally strong is a huge portion of our national security. Many people believe that other countries are encouraging us to borrow more because it is weakening us. That only makes sense in my mind. And so this is a huge national security risk at a time when global hotspots appear to be everywhere. Um, Just finally, there could be an economic crisis, meaning inflation happens, uh, interest rates go up, you can't get out of it. And if we get through all of those and we're fine, we've still hosed our children because we've said we have given a budget that is terrible. You owe all sorts of money on it, interest payments. You owe all sorts of promises that you have to obligate to support us, even though we didn't do anything to invest in your future. And there's going to be huge intergenerational tension. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what? I don't know about your household, we, but huge intergener- intergenerational tension is already here. Right. If you have teenagers, <laughs> that's just the status quo. All right. We've, we've had lots of numbers, and now we're going to do math. And, and there are a couple more numbers, maybe. Um, that you will not be tested on this. Uh, so in spite of what some political actors would have us believe, we can't just eliminate deficits and start paying down the debt overnight. Maybe 25 years ago, you know, 25 years ago, some of you might might remember worrying about uh, what happens if we pay off all the debt. Well, that's not our problem now. (laughs) Um, The budget math is really against us. And uh, uh, CRFB on their blog uh, had a couple of posts last week about the budget math. And, and just, I just wanted to see if, if Maya could give you some, some idea of the scale of the problem and, and how much you would actually have to cut spending uh, just to stabilize the debt relative to GDP and start to bring it down to more manageable levels. So, Maya? Yeah, one of the things that I think is very important is that you set out fiscal goals that are reasonable. Well, 
well, first, it would be great if we just set out fiscal goals, period. Um, <laughs> we actually don't pass budgets. So if we did, there are no requirements for fiscal goals in those budgets, but we get around that by not passing budgets. Um, the Senate Budget Committee did not even offer a budget this past year. I don't know how someone gets to keep their job if that happens. Um, but the, the other problem, though, is when people overpromise. And so you will hear promises, I'm going to balance the budget in either 10 years or four years. And the answer is, no, you're not. And it is a huge disservice to pretend that, because once you put out goals that you're going to completely miss, then the whole process gets compromised. So it used to be that you would try to balance the budget. To balance the budget would require 15 or 16, you have my number, 16, we'll go with 15, so I'm not exaggerating, $15 trillion over a decade of savings, right? We just did the Fiscal Responsibility Act, which focused just on discretionary spending. I'm a fan of this. I think this was a great policy. Shouldn't have been tied to the debt ceiling, but it was great that we generated some savings. I hope we stick to them. But that was one to two trillion. So we are not gonna be able to suddenly save $15 trillion the next go around. We are so dysfunctional, the polarization is huge, people have promised not to raise taxes, cut defense, cut Social Security and Medicare. It's not gonna happen. The last time we raised anything close, I mean, that we saved anything close to 15 trillion was never, not even close. So I, th I think a lot about like, what's the best fiscal goal that we could get to? And I think the most aggressive, and I honestly don't even think we could get there, but would be to the stabilize the debt where it is, keep it under 100% of GDP. That's gonna require about seven trillion in savings. We've done a blueprint, we being a nonprofit where nobody aspires to be anything other than what we are, no political aspirations, so we can say things that are suicidal. And to get there, you have to do everything. We raised a lot of taxes. We cut every dollar we could find in Social Security and Medicare. We cut money in defense, and we're not going to be able to. Defense is going up. It's not going down. That's just the reality of where we are. So that was a huge lift. Um, but my, my push to Congress is pick as high a goal as you can possibly get to, but that is actually reasonable and we could get there. If we had savings packages going forwards of two, three, four trillion, I would call that a huge win at this point. Okay. Um, a couple of y'all have touched on this, uh, uh, one more from political, another from process perspective, but I think a significant barrier to addressing uh, deficits and debt is partly a process problem uh, and a political problem. Um, so what is broken about fiscal policy making that makes it so hard to do anything to reduce deficits, and uh, what are some process fixes that could that might enable progress? So I am firmly in the camp that was begun by uh, Rudolf Penner, the second uh, CBO director. Rudy is famous for saying the process isn't the problem; the problem is the problem. I'm with him. I don't think these are process fix. I think this is a leadership issue. You could take the existing budget process and generate uh, uh, serious attempts to, to address it if we had presidential leadership, first and foremost, that provided the air cover for Congress to do the things that are necessary to do. Without that, there is no process that Congress can execute on that will solve the problem. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I think, I mean, we do have process problems. We don't pass a budget. 70% of the budget is on autopilot every year. But the ultimate driver here is not the process. It is that over the next 30 years, Medicare faces a $77 trillion shortfall. Social Security faces a $38 trillion shortfall. And no one is pledging to do anything about it. You could have any process in the world, but until it is not politically suicidal to point out that we can't borrow $116 trillion for two programs, we're not going to fix the problem. And I'm going to level with you. There is no way to address long-term deficits, no way to stabilize the debt at 100% of GDP unless Social Security is reformed and Medicare is reformed and middle class taxes are going up. I don't, look, I'm, I'm a conservative, I hate tax hikes. You can't get rid of a $116 trillion shortfall just on spending cuts. The math doesn't work and the politics don't work. And the reason the problem gets worse is because the three things law politicians take off the table are Social Security, Medicare, and, and middle class tax changes. Again, I'd hate the idea of raising middle class taxes and I wanna minimize it as possible. 
My, but I, I feel like it's my duty as someone who, who works in this policy to warn you, you should expect that your middle class, that middle class taxes will rise over the long term because that's just where the numbers are. Can, can I respond because I also think the, oh, track clap for Brian. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I do think the process can make a difference a little bit. I think a huge part of the problem is that everything you need to do to fix the fiscal problem is the opposite of what our polarized moment has created. So if you want to create fiscal uh, progress, you need to focus on the long term, not the short term, like not the immediate, the longer term. That, this is good for the health of the economy and making things sustainable. You need to focus on good policy not good politics. You need to admit that there are hard choices instead of pretending everything is a free lunch. And you need to compromise, which used to be a good word and now in a lot of circles is a bad word. So those are literally the opposites of the things I see going on with polarization. So it actually leads me to think that the process does have to be more of the fix. We actually have to take some of this power away. It's not very democratic, but our democratic leaders are not doing anything hard. They're unwilling to. So I would require that there's a budget, and if there's no budget, I'd have an auto CR or an auto CR that cuts spending across the board or spending and raises tax across the board, something that encourages a budget but makes an automatic one. I would stick with the PAYGO rules. PAYGO means if you're putting new spending in place or tax cuts, you have to offset it. And they have this whole workaround where at the end of the year, there's a scorecard, they pretend it didn't happen, they wipe it clean, they don't even know the vote happens. I would make it really clear that PAYGO is the law, and you have to stick to it. So if you want to do something, this is what budgeting is. If you want to do something, you have to figure out how to pay for it. Um, and I have come around to the belief that we desperately need a fiscal commission or something that would <coughs> insulate the politicians from the actual hard choices that they have to make. So I think, um, I mean, the problem is the problem, the leadership is the problem, but I also think the process could help nudge us towards a solution. Would either of y'all like to comment on the fiscal commission idea? There, there is a lot of information on, uh, on Maya's website. Uh, again, I keep pointing people there. Uh, on, it, it's a whole FAQ on fiscal, fiscal commission and, and what it means, how it would work, and, and that sort of thing. So, I, so I'll make two points, and in the process disagree with Maya, which is something that she and I do really well. Um, <laughs> but, not point, but not that often. I know. But, but point number one is, you know, I really do not believe you can ask people to put the politics aside and, and go do the right thing. They're politicians. They, they can't put the po politics aside. That's who they are. So it, it is incumbent on people like me to make good policy, good politics. And that's what we need to do. We need to get the, the, the education to the public and the, the, uh, change the atmosphere that surrounds the, the politics so that it is good politics uh, to, to do the right thing. And, and, you know, I, I've dedicated my adult life to that mission and to the notion that better educated policymakers will make better decisions. There's absolutely no evidence that any of those things are true. So, <laughs> for the record, so that's number one. But I, I, I do question whether you can trap them into doing the right thing. It never works. Um, second, fiscal commission. I'm, I'm not a believer. Um, I was t telling Brian, the very first commission was created by the very first president, George Washington. It was supposed to solve what became the Whiskey Rebellion. He had to send in the troops and shoot my, my ancestors. <laughs> Commissions fail. Um, they, they all fail. In the end, members of Congress have to vote. And they have to be willing to take the vote that will support a good policy. And so we're back to that, to that issue. A commission won't get you around that problem. And so I want, I want this commission idea that you can end run Congress and end run our, our politics. Th that's, that's an illusion. It's not going to work. I was also on the Financial Crisis Commission. Uh, two years, millions of taxpayer dollars, accomplished nothing. No more commissions. I have, uh, I've also had the joy of working on a commission that didn't work. I staffed the 2011 super committee that failed miserably. I was Senator Portman's lead negotiator. I I'll take the squishy middle between the two of you <laughs> on commissions. But here's what a commission can't do. A commission cannot create the will for reform when no will exists. If Congress does not want to fix the problem, a commission cannot make them. They will not get together, they will not compromise, they will not take the risky vote. And my worry right now with the commission is, even if we create one, 
if you don't have presidential and congressional leadership buy-in of both parties, they're never going to compromise, they're never going to build a realistic plan, and they're never going to bring it to the floor and pass it. You have to have the will to reform first. If you get the will to reform, a commission can help structure the reforms. It can get everybody in the room, it can create a structure, it can provide some credibility to the public, and it can get fa fast-track vote in Congress. So you can implement a will with commissions, but my worry is a lot, if you want to know if a commission is serious, check who they appoint to it. If they appoint congressional leaders and chairmen of major committees, this is a serious commission. If they appoint backbenchers and ideologues who have no history of compromising and no, no real credibility, then this is a check the box commission that, that, that's gonna die a quick death. Okay, so uh, we've got a leadership issue. <laughs> that, that's a big part of why we're here. Yep. Um, so uh, we've only got uh, about nine minutes left. Uh, we're not gonna get to tax policy or inflation or regulation, I guess, uh, unless y'all wanna ask questions about those things. So we're gonna use the last, uh, last nine minutes um, for questions from the audience. Right here in the front, we've got one. Why is nobody mentioning billionaires? <laughs> I'll, Brian, I can take Brian, that. Um, a blog post just a couple of weeks ago. I, just, I wrote a report <laughs> last year Repeat the question. The, the question, why aren't we talking about billionaires? I wrote a report last year, you can Google, called The Limits of Taxing the Rich. And billionaire taxes are going to have to be on the table because everything is going to have to be on the table. If we're going to tax the middle class, like I said, I'm sorry they're going to, you're damn right. Rich people should be on the table as well. They have the ability to pay, and I think they will be on the table. But we also have to be realistic. If you seized every dollar from every billionaire, and I mean every house, every yacht, every car, every investment, every business, right down to the kids' Nerf basketball hoop, you could fund the government one time for nine months. That, and then it's gone because the resource is gone. It's not a renewable resource. When their wealth is gone, it's gone. One time for nine months. So the idea that billionaires can fix the problem, I think, is mathematically just not the case. The idea that if you're going to ask you know, plumbers, waitresses, and teachers to pay more in taxes, billionaires should be included, you're damn right. Uh, what contribution could um, a more generous immigration policy make to reducing the deficit? So the question is, what contribution can more generous immigration policy make to reducing the deficit? Uh, there is no single, I think I'll answer this. Um, there is no single economic policy that is more powerful than immigration reform, period. Um, the native born population in the United States has sub replacement for fertility, fancy talk for. In the absence of immigration, we're Japan. We get older, we get smaller, we get less potent on the, on the global stage. The flip side to that is all of our future growth in population, workforce, competition and skills of that workforce, and thus the economy hinges on our immigration decisions, and we are currently fumbling this opportunity away. Okay. Doug, you had a, uh, on your, um, I don't know if you call it a blog or your, on, on your website. Uh, Those are personal musings that are therapy yeah, each day. Yeah, uh, <laughs> da daily, daily, daily something. Uh, just the other day, about um, how much money we spend on immigration enforcement <laughs> yeah. versus how much we would spend if we actually processed immigrants in the normal fashion and put them to work. Yeah. Um, or let them go to work. It's the problem with being an economist. You're always trying to find the least cost solution to a problem. And, um, you know, it, it is way cheaper to... Uh, uh, execute on the on the legal immigration and visa granting system than to um, uh, sort of try to close up the southern border, which is a real problem. I, I don't want to minimize that. That would be a mistake. It's a very very serious problem. But it is cheap to get people into the into the uh, into the economy. And right now we have an enormous visa backlog, 
And um, a wise man once told me, if, if you've got a problem that you can solve by just throwing money at it, that's an easy problem, solve it. And we can, by the scale of the federal budget, solve this backlog and put millions of people to work and generate tons of additional uh, GDP and tax revenue if we, if we just um, uh, gave the U.S. Customs and Immigration Service a, a little more resources. It is right now a fee-driven system so that the immigration uh, community, the immigrants and, and the people um, bringing them here, are paying fees to, to, make, to run the system and the backlog is enormous. If we just pumped a little extra money in there, it would be, be a, a sensible thing to do. Uh, I don't want to call on everybody in the front. Let's go uh, uh, over here. so much, hey, we've got to cut the spending, but there may be some other things you need to think about from a policy perspective that would perhaps uh, maybe bring our Medicare costs in line with, maybe not in line, but closer to what it is around the rest of the world? So I think we all have ideas in this, and so why don't you go oh, first and we'll go, no, go, go for first. It. You guys do help. Okay, here. So here, here's the deal. I'll he, he, here's the important things on, on uh, Social Security and Medicare. Uh, Social Security is just money. It's way simpler, and, and anyone on this panel can fix it numerically. It's about the politics of getting to reform. But the important characteristics Social Security and Medicare share is that they are growing much more rapidly than the economy will grow, and thus any source of tax revenue will grow. So it's not about cutting them. It's about having them grow more slowly so that they grow at the pace of the economy and no faster. So that's the goal. With Medicare, um, th there are four parts to Medicare, cleverly named A, B, C, and D, and um, A is the one that, that is, has a payroll tax. The others are uh, premium financed, but, but when they designed them, they thought, oh, can't have them pay the whole premium. I mean, no one should pay for their health care. So the premiums cover about a quarter of the cost of the Medicare program. Three quarters is, comes from general revenue. So it has an unlimited draw on the Treasury. And that's a problem. Medicare is by itself responsible for a third of all federal debt outstanding. First thing you should do is just stop the unlimited draw. Put Medicare on a budget and say to the Medicare community, the beneficiaries, the doctors, the providers, the farmers, companies, the device makers, this is it. This is what you got this year. Go do something good with it. And then you could maybe take that 7% growth rate and get it down to something closer to the four we need uh, while, while still delivering medical services. But turning Medicare into a high value system is the key. Right now it spends a lot of money, delivers adequate care. Everyone thinks he can do better on the quality front. It should cost less as well. Go, go, next question. Okay. Uh, right here. What about raising the max on Social Security? You the payroll deduction. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, keep in mind, though, the reason the, 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 reason the tax is capped is because the benefit is capped. And so, you know, it, you, the question if you raise the cap is do you also let the benefit rise? Or do you, for the first time, delink the tax and the benefits? Mm -hmm. um, but if you do it, let's say you eliminate the cap, you eliminate about half of Social Security's shortfall. You know, Social Security has a shortfall that's going to balance at about 1.8% of GDP by the 2030s. Getting rid of the cap and giving no benefits gets you about 0.9% of GDP, so about half. So. I think lifting the cap should be on the table. It's going to be part of the solution along with age and benefits. Really, again, the three real levers with Social Security are the tax, the age, and upper income benefits. You can't solve the problem with raising the cap, but it'll be part of the solution when they do it. It's also really important, though, that you can't solve it with that because uh, a lot of people just say, I would lift the payroll tax cap, and that's it. That isn't a full so solution. It did used to be a decade plus ago, and it's just a reminder that by procrastinating, the cost of waiting to fix Social Security has been huge. So all the things that we could have done before that would have fixed it, and people would really not have felt much difference at all, those are no longer available to us. We're going to have to basically do every Social Security change there is. I would definitely lift the payroll tax cap, but I wish we didn't have to because I would raise revenues for higher income people, but my first best use of it is not giving pensions to people who don't need them. I think we need those dollars for a lot of other things 
more, much more, uh, much, or much greater priority. So really the cost of waiting has been huge, and I hear a lot of people thinking we should wait until the last minute, and that to me is a fireable offense across the board. We already have. <laughs> I mean, when we were doing, well, we're, when I mean, we're we're doing social security reform, years. when we were doing social security reform back with, with Bush, and I was at the, at the, um, at, at the CBO, my bumper sticker was, get Doug Cole taken, because I was the kind of guy who doesn't need the pension that I was promised. Um, I'm, uh, you know, the trailing edge of the baby boom generation, which is the demographic shift. And if you grandfather me, you've grandfathered the problem. And so far, they've grandfathered me. Yeah, by letting the whole baby boom retire without catching them, that has been a huge problem. And I think, mo I, think I speak for all of us that we would say cutting the benefits of people who don't need them first would be, yeah. along with raising the retirement age, would be the most sensible priorities. Okay, um, I've got a, a clock flashing over, he over here. Uh, it says zero, 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 zero. <laughs> uh, Turns so out that's the rating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with that, uh, I want to thank our panelists for, for coming out today and thank all of you all for, uh, for enduring us.